Assalamu alaikum, Janob Uzbek Entertainment kanalida Kamila Faruq sizlar bilan. Bugun do'stlar sizlarga Chikago haqida ma'lumot bermoqchiman. Videomiz ikki qismga bo'linadi. Birinchi qismi Chikago haqida ma'lumot, ikkinchi qismi esa Chikagoning go'zal va betakror arxitektura san'atini ko'rsatmoqchiman. Do'stlar, videoni oxirigacha ko'ring. Yoqqan bo'lsa like va podpisatsiya knopkasini bosib qo'yishni unutmang. Qani bo'lmasam Chicago bir uzoq tarixga ega. 1830-37-yillarda shu go'zal bir shahar vujudga kelgan. Undan oldin o'sha tarixchilarni bu ma'lumotlarni men o'sha Wikipediyadan oldim, manbasi. O'sha tarixda Kubeklik va Antariyoli indeyslar kelib, shu yerda yashashgan ekan. Algonquin tilida gaplashadigan. Algonquin tilida Chicago shahri o'sha paytda Chicago deb atalgan. Ajoyib ta, Chicago. Ajoyib, unik. Keyinchalik u Chicago deb nomlanishni boshlagan. Xo'p, Chicago o'zi qanday shahar? Chicago unda qancha odam yashaydi? Aholi soni qancha? Umuman aqshda boshqa shtatlarga, boshqa katta shaharlarga nisbatan kattaligi qanaqa, nimasi bilan farq qiladi? Kelinglar, shu haqda ozgina bir ma'lumot bersam. Chicago 1837-yilda o'sha tashkil qilinib, ya'ni Mississippining go'zal daryolari, buyuk daryolari va ko'llaridan oqib kelgan o'zanlar, o'zanlar hisobiga Chicago ni atrofida Michigan ko'li sohillari vujudga keladi. Shuning natijasida bu yerga ko'p odamlar shu Michigan ko'li sohillari borligi uchun ko'l bor joyga, daryo bor joyga albatta bilasizlar odamlarni doim o'ziga jalb qilgan tabiatni, go'zal manzaralari, ko'llar, daryolar odamlari hamisha o'ziga jalb qilgan. O'sha paytda xuddi shunday voqea sodir bo'lgan. O'sha odamlar ko'chib kelib, shu joyga, ya'ni uylar qurishni boshlagan, shaharlar qurishni boshlagan. Shuning natijasida Chicago 1837-yilda Chicago vujudga kelgan shu shahar, go'zal shahar vujudga kelgan. Uni Keyinchalik 1900-yillarda shu yerda me'morchilik san'ati, go'zal arxitektura, biznes, logistika, boshqa bir sohalar rivojlanishni boshlagan. Lekin 1871-yilda baxtga qarshi Chikagoda juda ham katta yong'in sodir bo'ladi. Bu yong'inda bir 100 minglab odam o'zlarini uylarini yo'qotadi, ya'ni uy sotadi. Bu shu tabiat hodisasi shunaqa bir disaster bo'lib, hamma yo'lda olov-olov qadam paydo bo'lgan, hamma bu yomg'ir qanday paydo bo'lgan, ko'pchilik har xil versiyalar bor. Bularga chuqur yondashdi, xohlamadim. Endi yong'in bo'lgan, bo'lgan bo'lib o'tgan, buni qanday bo'lgan, nima bo'lgan, buni detallariga sizlarga ta'lim qilishni xohlamadim, chunki bu ko'p vaqt oladi. Shunga Chikagoda juda katta yong'in sodir bo'lish natijasida shuning shimoliy sharqiy qismi butunlay yer bilan yakson bo'ladi. Ko'pchilik binolar, uylar, magazinlar hamma yo'q yonib kul bo'ladi-da. Keyin 30 yilda ichida Chikagoli shaharliklarning shu Chikagoda yashayotgan insonlarning irodasi kuchliligi natijasida 30 yil davomida 1909-yil, 1900-yilda juda ham bir yana o'sha asl holatiga undan da go'zal holatiga qaytib keladi Chikago. Juda ham go'zal industriya o'sha paytda juda ham katta shaharga aylanadi. Bir o'sha 1900-yilda qayta qurilgandan keyin dunyoning eng katta 5 ta shaharlari ichiga kiradigan deb tan olinadi shu Chikago. Shuning uchun yana nima desak bo'ladi? Chikago haqida ko'p ma'lumotlar bor. Chikagoda asosan xalqaro madaniyat, san'at, me'morchilik san'ati, logistika, telekommunikatsiya, biznes markazi deb hisoblangan. Hozirdan hisoblanadi. Bu yerda ko'p shu 2018-yilda oxirgi 2018-yilda statistika ko'ra, ya'ni iqtisodiy indikator bor. Yalta milliy mahsulot Chikagoda shu 1 yil davomida ishlab chiqarilgan tovarlar va xizmatlarning miqdori 686 milliard dollarga teng deb topilgan o'sha statistika bo'yicha. Bu degani juda ham o'sha Chicago Chicago hududi shaharni o'zi mas'ul Chicago va Chicago hududi deganda Chicago o'zi bitta shahar va uning hududlari bor, ya'ni rayonlari bor, okruglari bor, tumanlari bor. O'sha 250 ta tuman deyiladi. Shu shular hammasini bo'lib turib, Greater Chicago area, Chicago land deb turib, o'sha statistika shu 686 million dollarni tashkil qilgan. VZP deyiladi ruschasiga. 
o'zbekchasiga biz o'sha tarjima qilganda makro iqtisodiy statistika bo'yicha yalpi milliy mahsulot 2018-yilda ko'rsatkichi 686 milliard dollarga teng bo'lgan ekan. Aholi soni shaharning o'zida 2 million 686 ming Umuman Chicago, Chicago Land, hamma Chicago ni atrofi 328 mil osha Chicago ni hamma tuman va okruglari bo'yicha aholi soni eng ziddiy joylashgan 10 million aholi sonini tashkil qiladi. Bundan tashqari Chicagoda nima desak bo'ladi? Chicagoda katta biznes markazi, ya'ni diversifikatlash, diversifikatsiyalashgan iqtisodiy markaz ham hisoblanadi. Bu yerda logistika, katta kompaniyalar, telekommunikatsiya ilm ma'rifat o'sha uh, education deydi, katta yaxshi deb ham uh, dunyo bo'yicha tan olingan universitetlar ham mas Chicago, Chicagoda o'zida joylashgan. Endi bu universitetlar Chicago University of Illinois, yana bir necha Roosevelt, bir, bir necha yaxshi universitetlar bor. Uh, yana ta'lim olmoqchi bo'lgan insonlar bo'lsa, bemalol olib shu yerga keladigan bo'lsa, shu shahar tanla tanlasa adashmaydi, chunki bu shahar non shahri. Siz ta'lim olish bilan birgalikda uh, bu yerda shu o'qishdan keyin bir ishlashingiz ham mumkin, ozmuncha pul topishingiz mumkin, jon berishingiz mumkin, oilaga yordam qilishingiz mumkin. Albatta, agar siz 3 ta narsaga chida olsangiz yoki shu narsaga adaptatsiya qila olsangiz, bu narsa birinchisi juda ham qattiq qish qorboron muzlama mashinada qish 6 oy deb qishda tan ola olasiz, hisobla olasiz. Ikkinchisi trafik ya'ni propkalar ko'chadagi uchinchisi ya'ni ya, juda ham yomon yo'llar, shahar ichida ayrim ko'chalar, yo'llar juda ham yomon. Remont qilib turishadi albatta, endi bu yerning natijasi nima deb o'ylayman, shu nisbatan bular o'zini vaqtida o'sha bu yo'llarni nima deydi, remont qilib, to'g'rilab, yoz yoz kuz oylarida qishga chiqishga sezonga tayyorlab borishadi, lekin baribir qor ko'p yoqqani uchun, yerga ko'p qor sochilgani uchun tuzlar sochilgani uchun qorda erib tushdim, ya'ni ya'ni baxtsiz hodisalarni xavfli avtotransport halokatlarini oldin olish uchun hamma joyda yerga tuz sochiladi. To'g'rimi? O'shani hisobiga deyman, yerda shu yerni sifatli bog'orgacha yoz yoz oylarigacha borguncha ham yomon bo'lib ketadi, yomon ahvolga tushadi. Asosan Chicago o'zida agar siz sabgurtlar deylar, ya'ni tumanlar, prigridlarga chiqsangiz, prigridlarda qaysi ma'noda yo'llari yaxshi va keng, yaxshi yo'llar. Bu endi men bu bilan nima demoqchiman? Mavzudan chetlanmaslik uchun infrastrukturasi juda ham yaxshi, toza, juda ham go'zal shahar. 2018-yilning natijasi bo'yicha Chicagoga o'sha statistika bo'yicha 58 million kishi turist tashrif buyurgan. New Yorkdan keyin ikkinchi o'rinda turgan, o'sha paytda New Yorkda 60 million, 65 million kishi tashrif buyurgan edi 2018-yilda. Xullas Chicago juda ham go'zal shahar. Buni bu shaharda juda ham ajoyib qiziqarli avtobiografiyalar, ya'ni insonlar yashab o'tgan, yashab kelishyapti. Bular haqida ham yaxshi bir ekskluziv kontentlar qilishga harakat qilaman. Videolarimizni kuzating. Yoqqan bo'lsa like, yoqmagan bo'lsa dislike, yoqqan bo'lsa podcast kanalimizni bosishni unutmang va ikkinchi qismida biz men sizga o'sha Chicago ni cruise orqali daryoni shunda o'rtasidan shaharning o'rtasidan o'sha Michigan ko'lini oqib keladigan daryo o'zi ham bor. O'sha daryo hosil qilgan shaharning o'rtasidan oqib o'tadi. O'sha yerdan turib, sohil bo'yilaridan turib, o'sha daryoning o'rtasida qayoqqa o'tirib olib, o'sha me'morlarni, o'sha arxitektura san'atlarini, binolar, osmon o'pa go'zal, betakror binolarni ko'rsatishga harakat qiladi. Kanalni oxirigacha kuzating videoda biz siz bilan hamisha birgamiz. Yaxshi kayfiyat sizni hech qachon tark etmasin. Salomat bo'ling. This we look out of Lake Michigan to our left, the Little River history. Chicago, the name of the river is coming from Native American Chicago, or place of the smelly onions. 1673, Father Marquette and Louis Joliet arrived here, exploring for France, and their 10-year-old Native American river guide shows them a shortcut through the continent. 
But when you got to the end of the south branch of this river, there's a little eastern continental divide. You cross that, and you're at the southern flowing Des Plaines River, Illinois River, Big Muddy, the Mississippi. Thus, Chicago would become the critical link in the waterway system connecting the entire continental United States. The 1848 Illinois Mission Canal made this a boom town a million people by 1890. But a million people would be hog butchered through the world as the great poet Carl Sandburg named us because of our Union stockyards on the south side, immortalized in Upton Sinclair's famous novel, The Jungle. Well, you see, without an EPA, everybody used the river as a sewer, meatpacking plants and residents alike, polluting our drinking source Lake Michigan, killing Chicagoans by droves of typhoid and cholera epidemics. So 1900 saw the completion of a new canal, but we got smart. The Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal was dug so deep off the south branch, using gravity, we caused the river to reverse direction and flow backwards. Yay! We saved our drinking water Lake Michigan, and we sent all that pollution south to St. Louis, Missouri instead. Um, I'd like to apologize to anyone from St. Louis for that. Don't worry, we're getting the river. Okay. 45 degrees off the left bow. Three towers merged together now to become Vista Towers. Architect Jeannie Gang, her company Studio Gang, topping out 1,198 feet to soon be the third tallest building in Chicago and give Jeannie Gang the title once again of tallest building in the world by a woman-led architectural firm. Jeannie's muse, her inspiration comes from the frustrum. You know what that is? That's a crystal formation. Look at a sapphire or fluorite. And you can see that design in the lobby box, like a pyramid with a point cut off inverted. Pull back and that same kind of crazy design works its way through the three towers. You know, there's six different tints of blue and green and clear glass in there as Jeannie wanted to evoke the ever-changing colors of the Chicago River. And to mitigate the wind on the windward side of the building, look at the highest tower, 83 and 84 exposed. Now that's called a blow-through hole. An engineer would tell you that's going to confuse the wind, so you don't want the wind stressing the building out. It has an outlet to get to the other side. Look all the way down the river now, we see the second tallest building in Chicago now, Trump International Hotel and Tower, Adrian Smith Architect, Skidmore, Owings & Merrill, 2009. At 98 stories and 1,171 feet, it is slightly shorter than Jeannie Gang's building, but listed as taller by design because the architect put a spire on the roof and spires count as height, taking the building up to 1,388 feet. Now, Adrian Smith with the Trump Tower gives us a great example of contextualism, which means architecture should not happen in a vacuum, right? You relate to what's around you. So look how, so the building doesn't move over the entire neighborhood, he puts in setback levels corresponding roughly to buildings on either side of the river. It fits in better that way. Let's go back to Jeannie Gang. Look 45 degrees way up at that building with the way cool curvy balconies. Jeannie Gang's first skyscraper, Aqua Towers, from 2009, 859 feet. First time she got the tallest building in the world by a woman-led architectural firm title. Now, Lewis Sullivan of Chicago School once said, form follows function. The function for Jeannie Gang was to make sure every single floor of this mixed-use hotel and condo building would have great views. So she worked with her assistants from the outside in. Can you imagine that? First you find a wonderful view, and then you make the balconies fit the view. They did this with models, and they would point a laser pointer from a great view, say Millennium Park downtown, back towards the building. Now, if the laser pointer made a straight line into an existing window, everything's copacetic. You had a view. If the laser hit the wall, Jeannie decided she did not have to be symmetrical. If there's a view here, move that balcony two feet left, move that one a foot and a half left. Form of 45 degrees here right, you will see a very intriguing building with an almost mosque-like, Moorish, yellow onion skin dome. That is the Hotel Intercontinental. It was built in 1930 as the Medina Athletic Club, a project that the philanthropic group will often call themselves the uh, Sons of the East. You might know them for their pheasants, go-karts, circuses and hospitals, just the Medina Shriners. Now, get this, in 1930 they had a grandiose flag. The dome of the Medina Athletic Club, they decided, would be perfectly suitable as a landing pad for airships like the Goodyear Blimp. 
I must tell you the steampunk green would die with the Hindenburg crashing. You might remember that when it crashed, but the original literally fell out of favor. Now the Zeller building, this has fidelity. This bronze box coming up on our right introduces us to the architectural style known as modernism. Born at the Bauhaus, an art compound in 1920s Germany, emerging industry and art, modernist architecture was all about structure. Highly articulated structure, but what is lacking? You don't see one ounce of decoration. No ornamentation allowed. The modernists were about celebrating the materials. If I put decoration on my building, my modernist friends would call me bourgeois, so Perk was dishonest and they wouldn't buy lunch that day. And we're going to see the work of the third director of the famous Bauhaus, Ludwig Mies Andro, who is the father of American modernism, shortly. Right now, though, London can have Big Ben, Paris, the Eiffel Tower, I'm a Chicago. I'll take the clock tower on the right of the one and only Wrigley Building, 1921, North Face added 1924. Commissioned indeed by chewing gum king, William Wrigley Jr., who as a young man premiered Juicy Fruits Gum at the Colombian Exposition, Chicago World's Fair of 1893. He brought the fair home, that's what it looked like, friends. That is Spanish revival. That clock tower modeled on the 11th century Verona Tower in Spain. And now the tiles cladding the Wrigley Building, that is terracotta. You see, terracotta was really popular after the Great Chicago Fire because terracotta is fire clay and makes it fireproof. From an artist's perspective, Charles Beersman uses terracotta like a painter, having the tiles baked in six different colors to get a really cool shading technique upon the face of the building. We pass under our Grand Boulevard of Michigan Avenue. We like to call it in the French man of Boulevard of Michigan was inspired by the great public boulevards of Paris. But hey, let's take it to the bridge. What happened to the bridge? The bridge we call Du Sable Bridge. We honor our first permanent resident, the French-speaking fur trader from Haiti, Jean-Baptiste Montusabo, started the fur trading empire right there, man, in 1779. The world's fair is with us again. Look, 45 degrees off the left ball, beautiful building with cupola dome, and water tanks is the jewelers building, last of the revivalist wonders before the Great Depression. Inspired by the 15th century Italian monastery, the Chateau de Pavia, but built here for the diamond trade. Back in 26, you could drive your Model T auto filled with diamonds, lower whacker drive into your basement. Your car was lifted up by elevator secure. Security was a bit of an issue. This was prohibition. Alcohol was illegal, but they give you a tip. Chicago's never been dry. You could have a drink during prohibition at an illegal tavern called a speakeasy. You had to have a password. Rumor has it there was one right below the dome. Now, that has never been proven. But it says, as soon as they lifted prohibition, boom, the Stratosphere Lounge was ready to open for business, just like that in the same space. Now, this black box coming up on the right, the epitome of modernism, is from the third director of the famous Bauhaus, Ludwig Mies von Droh. Ludwig Mies von Droh came to Chicago in 1938, becoming director of the Illinois Institute of Technology, spread that aforementioned modernist style around the globe. I bet you've heard Mises' famous expression, less is more. Modernism is often called minimalism because you take away the decoration and strip your building down to essential structure. I'll make it real simple. Skeleton, skin, space. Skeleton is the frame holding the building up. Skin is the glass curtain wall, and space about 90% of the time for the modernist is a big box. And then there's a rebel in the modern crowd coming up next, Bertrand Goldberg, who never did like squares, hence his curve linear. Marina City Towers earning their nickname the Corn Cop Towers in the 1960s. Now, Bertrand Goldberg had studied with Mies van der at the Bauhaus, but he rejected boxes in favor of a circle to bring people together. He referred to these towers as curvilinear flower form, a core-like stem first to house elevators and utilities, the rings like petals from the base up. Working with the janitor's union, when the river was totally industrial, there was nothing out here, trying to find a way to do residential living downtown for people who work downtown but they wanted 24-hour living. So he put everything at home, from four restaurants to a bowling alley to a swimming pool to a bank, to that space age George Jetson parking you need a valet and your living space upstairs. Now look to your left, 
Let's look at this building called 55 West Wacker Drive. I think you have to look right at it to understand its style. I introduce you now to the style known as brutalism, coming from the fringe metal brute or raw concrete. The brutalists, my friends, were modernists who took too many steroids. Yes, they celebrate structure. They went a little over the top with those heavy rustic forms. Brutalism wanted to give your institution a sense of gravitas, shall we say, of lasting forever. So that brutal style you'll find in very popular civic institutions like uh, university campuses, public libraries. And now I am now a proud member of a Facebook page called the Brutalism Appreciation Society. And people just post pictures of hideous concrete buildings all over the globe. Now one of my favorite things in architecture, I, I tend to love history, so in architecture I love historical architecture. I love adaptive reuse, which means instead of starting from scratch, why not take a brand old building and if it is structurally sound, reimagine it for today. That's what's happening with the 1914 Reed Murdoch Warehouse on our right by George Neiman's. Built in 1914, here we are, 106 years later, and it is thriving today as a restaurant called River Roast. Now, Neiman's was actually associated, like the great Frank Lloyd Wright, who started out in Oak Park outside Chicago, with the Prairie School. Prairie School architects evoke our flat Midwestern landscape. Their designs hug the horizon, balanced here by a clock tower. Note this building to be asymmetrical. Five arch bays on the right, you catch that? Only four on the left. The fifth bay had to go out when the LaSalle Street Bridge came in. 1928, during the widening process from LaSalle Street, the building was too far west, so they crawled, plowed through 20 feet. They de-widened the building. And I made up the word de-widen just for this tour. That's not a real word. Don't use it in Scrabble. I shouldn't tell you a word about our bridges. You know we have more movable bridges than anybody except Amsterdam? They were inspired by the bridges of Paris. They're called Trunnion Bastille. Bastille from the French for seesaw. Each state turning on the Trunnion pay with counterweight. Move counterweight, raise bridge in two minutes. They will start opening for the end of sailboat season in another month. Now, I can't impress upon you enough how Chicago changed the world through architecture. Because you couldn't build the wood after the fire, and because a load-bearing exterior brick wall had to increase six inches for every new floor, Chicagoans went to the iron and steel grid frame. This led to the Chicago School of Architecture. And yes, this is a simple early Chicago school. <laughs> Louis Sullivan, father of Chicago School, said your building should be like a green column, base, shaft, and capital. You want every inch of problem sort of thing. So you see what I mean? How important an internal frame was? Because now you were liberated, you could open up the building to natural light. And you know a big window like that in the building trays, you could call that a Chicago window, so here. Now on the right, one of the grandest examples of art in Echo, that rather streamlined, angular style coming out of the Paris exhibition of 1925 to 1930 Chicago Merchandise Mart. Whenever I say Art Deco, I become Art Deco. I'm, I'm angled, I'm streamlined, that's part of the style. You know this is the largest structure in America prior to completion of the Pentagon. It cost $32 million. The once great Chicago retailer, Marshall Field Department Store, commissioned it. Now they dreamed of a giant wholesale market. They woke up to the Great Depression, had to let it go for 13 million. <laughs> Joe Kennedy, father of our late president and senators, picked it up in 1945. I will tell you how Joe Kennedy saved that building on the way back. Right now, have your cameras at the ready. Welcome to the beginning of downtown Chicago. This is called Wolf Point, the confluence of the North Branch right and the approach from the East South Branch left. We'll see a lot of the South Branch since we're taking three weeks to go to New Orleans this morning. They told me that at the ticket booth, right? Okay. The birthplace of downtown Chicago today is a showplace for new architecture. It really began with 1983's Nuveen Building, 333 West Wacker Drive, this great curved glass structure, contextualism, everything's about the river as you can see, curving to meet the bend, reflecting architecture. This building set the bar high so that everything in the last five years had to match it. It said, you're gonna come downtown? You're gonna build around me? You better bring your A game. And everybody did. 150 North Riverside with its unique 
inverted pyramid design. We'll return to that. Directly ahead of us to be home to Port and Salt, the new River Point building. Adding an arch to say we're special, this is where the three branches meet. Matching that arch with an inverted parabola so kids tell me the building looks like a Hot Pockets frozen sandwich. And the great Spanish architect Santiago Calatrava's sculpture just went in about two weeks ago. Now on our right, this is the Wolf Point Tower Complex. These are both residential, Wolf Point West and East. You know, Chicago took a clue from San Antonio, Texas, who was reclaiming their river with the river walk in the 1980s. He said that's what Daniel Vernon was all about. So like they say in the movies, our river walk has been years in the making. But now, downtown is so vibrantly alive, people want to live in the heart of the city, so you've got a demand for residential living. There will be a third building here, uh, one point south 2023 already has a name, Salesforce. In case anyone's from California, you probably know Salesforce is the company that just did the tallest building out there in the San Francisco Bay Area. We're just going to tour a bit of the North Branch, which gets a pretty industrial after we uh, uh, get a little bit. But let's look at a few things. Here's history. The Carroll Avenue Bridge was used from 1908 to 1990. Now this old railroad bridge today is a ruin art, fixed in place. I love it because it's a great visual. You can see the counterweight in this case. It's single leaf basket. I think we keep it around to scare the people living in that salmon color building, Harry Weiss's 1981 Fulton House. That's probably the oldest building I'll show you on the river today, 1898, serving as a refrigerated warehouse for a good 70 years before architect Weiss would punch windows through those three foot thick masonry walls, turning it into condos like your freezer at home. He had to defrost the building for about three months. He had to scrape a lot of plaster and coarse hair off the walls. That was an insulating material back then. And then here it gets inspired by a single tree on the riverbank and does, when after 20 years on the river, remain my favorite four townhomes, the river cottages. They're so unique, I never thought anyone would leave. Number three sold out two years ago for 2.25 million. Note the porthole windows like you find on the ship, triangular skylights, like schooner sails, and spiral staircase like boat rigging. For Harry Weiss was an architect and a sailor. And when his friends in the 80s, when he did these, said, are you goofy, Harry? Nobody wants to live in that dirty little river. Harry's answer, water is a magnet. It will draw people to it. I think Harry Weiss understood the psychologist Carl Jung. That we humans have a Jungian archetype in our brain. We long for the sea, the blue, the azul. If you don't have an ocean, there are days, my friends. Oh yes, my friends, there are days when you awake in Chicago with an epiphany, a smile on your lips, and you'll repeat over and over, a river is enough, a river is enough, a river is enough. I'll leave you with that thought. Let's take a break as we turn the boat around. I want to give you a chance to digest some information and have a vodka lemonade from Zach's bar. Use the bathrooms. Hey, I think I'll come out one-on-one -on -one as I go off mic and Joey we head south, and I'll take some questions now. Thanks. Dostlar, interaction bo'ldi. Mana ajoyib, qandaydir kreativni yondashish tarixga, tabii har bir binoda tarixini tasvirlab beryapti. Men orqasidan haligi gapini bo'lib buzgim kelmadi, chunki juda ham ajoyib prezentatsiya. Men buni qani kutmagan edim. Juda ham perfect, excellent prezentatsiya bo'ldi, chunki ajoyib har birta binoda o'zgacha bir ranglar bilan, jilolar bilan tasvirlab berish bu Koyil lekin, koyil qoldim. Mana desen 20 yildan beri shu sohada, shu botda, shu qayiqda turistlarga shuna qilib Chikagoni binolarini, arxitektor sanatini, betakror go'zal sanatini, arxitektura sanatini tanishtiryapti. Bu juda ham ajoyib. Albatta, har bir narsa tajriba orqali yillar davomida shakllanadi. O'z-o'zidan bunaqa prezentatsiya bo'lmaydi, lekin 
acayip güzel tarihte bağla büyük yükünde bağla bana tıp prezidentlerde canop ismini eslap kol almadım kullas bana bana maşı kişi şilapalarda ki yu alıp menge okşap bana İntradakşın kılı yaptı. Acayip meyğe bu otta bir matta ham River Cruise kime gendim. Bu cüneyen başka çe bir hissiyat, başka çe bir tasarat bol yaptı. Cüneyen güzel, güzel bana çıkak ona acayip bana suunu üstü de suunu üstü de bana acayip bir Şehir şundeyen bir güzel eken. Darya böyle bir sayahat kime geldi. Bas turkı geldim. Bundan bir neçe yıllar var. Lekin buna kadar sını körüm oldum. Lekin katta köylüyen çıkanımız Huda Halası. Bu yıl albette keç bok kaldı. Huda Halası niyet var. Katta kruizge çıkış. Yani yollar açılıp pandemiler tügesi. Huda Halası kruizge çıkış. Onun tecrübesini körüş maksadı. Ben bu. Bana azizler. Chicago'da kuyoshli kun, kuyoshlar charaqlab turibdi. Kun ham unaqa darajada issiqmas. Juda ham go'zal va havo havo bo'lyapti, ajoyib. Mana mana lotkalarda dalil suzishyapti odamlar. Mana u ketyapti. Xullas bu Chicago'da shunaqa yaxshi mashi bahor oylaridan boshlab to kuzda mashi oktyabrigacha Sabr geçe, bir malal ne madide. Başına da acayip vaktizi unumlu, samarali utkisiz bolada, damasız bolada işten çarçe gelmişler. Ben hem şunu karar kıldım ve şu tecrübelerimle kastır manada bölüşüş, ulaş maksat. Kastır manada şu bizdikilerde ama kim şu bizim YouTube muhlislerine. Tarih bulan tanıştırış, arkitektura bulan tanıştırış. Şu özü, şu bu hane hem özüm hem okum, şimdi özüm hem resor çıkılıp, özüm hem kazdırmalı da örgen yapalım bu bazı bir narsalar. Çünkü şeydi yaşar, çıkar oldu tarihini yakışı bilmesek hem de. Köpçülük sorap kolardı, anak bir cevap verişke üyalık kolardı. Kullas hemen arsa hazır bir davarda internet de gendik, hemen arsa bar internette. Ama narsa ne olur? Karab körük oksa bol olur. Kapı hoş basa bol olur. Ben o işe orkayı kaydı. Bunlar orkayı orkayı kaydı yapmışlar. get right up to the point of that building. That's that's the new Chicago postcard right there. An L train going by 150 North Riverside. So you've got Amtrak and Metro train lines on the right of that building, the river on the east and only two acres. Thus, 150 North Riverside, which has effectively now been nicknamed either the tuning fork or the generous martini. This lot was vacant for 30 years until an innovative firm get to partner stepped up to complete this 2017 building. Now you see how they solved the problem of the tiny site. They only used 20% of the base 
can't deliver eight floors in, and then as they get up, they expand the full floor. It's 46 stories. Wait a minute. If you cut away your outer support walls, what do you think is holding that building up? You know they're working on the same principle. I'm slowly getting back to myself with all my yoga and Pilates, a strong central core. It's caissons, my friends. Third element of the Chicago School to think about. How do we anchor buildings in soil, which has resulted in the Great Lakes being carved out by glaciers here? So caissons, your support columns, are watertight, box-like structures filled with concrete. You want to anchor a building in Chicago? You better listen to Mr. Jeff Beck, and you better drill down, down, down. They went 110 feet to bed. Now Getch is pretty busy. Getch and Partners is just finishing up on our left new Bank of America building, topping out at 815 feet to be the tallest new office complex downtown since 1990. Ah, history, my friends. They tore down a building here, modeled after river barges. It was a 50s design. It was called General Grove, right up against the river. It just looked like a factory. I gotta say it wasn't that pretty. I don't know that anybody cried when it went away. But the Army Corps of Engineers made a great suggestion. They were working on the project. They said, well, you know what? That building did have some historical significance. You tear down the old, make room for the new. Can you honor what came before? So they did. Look right at eye level. See those corrugated steel plates? They salvaged the walls of the building they took away and brought it back as a second life as part of the river walk design. I love seeing that little nod to history there. Did you know sometimes to understand where you're going in this life, it never hurts to look back at where you've been. Now we have a great Art Deco corridor on either side of us with the Daily News building right, Civic Opera building love. By the way, to illuminate on the Art Deco style. When I say Art Deco, you can think the great Gatsby, the Jazz Age, the unbridled optimism of America in the 1920s. Early 20s was a period of unbridled prosperity. The country was moving forward, and the buildings reflected that. They're always streamlined and have an emphasis on speed and verticality, even as you look up. Daily News Building was the first building to jump the river, use air rights, and offer a public plaza. Now on our left, the Civic Opera Building, Art Deco 1928, I call a perfect marriage of pragmatism and art. Start with an opera house, surround yourself with corporate towers, you always still have revenue coming in. I'm oft times asked why it's a Civic Opera a building with a V instead of a U. Well, if you choose to use a pre-16th century Latin alphabet, you only have 23 letters. They're interchangeable. Now what happened after 1930 in architecture in America? Nothing for 25 years, can you believe it? And you know what put a standstill to architecture? What would be the two big events? The Great Depression, of course, followed by World War II. And then in the late 50s, early 60s, Mies, Van Droe, and the Bauhaus architects coming out of Germany, Germany and Europe really take hold. By 1965, look on your right, we're full blown into the modernist period. This is Gateway Center and air rights projects surrounding Union Station with Amtrak and Metro trains. Now, looking downriver here, we have a time machine of the evolution of architecture over 30 years. Let me set the time machine dial to 1965 and 67. Let's see if we're in the 60s. Turn on the radio. Superman, a great lantern, and got nothing on me. Yeah, we're in the 1960s. And that means Nisian architecture. Strip your building down to no more than skeleton skin and space. That's your pure black box modernism. Let me turn the dial forward to the 1970s. Check the radio. Well, there's a poem on a western bay. Yeah, we're definitely in the 70s now. And look at the white building. Gateway number three introduces us to international style. The international style is the idea that the future moves too fast. You should be totally neutral and everyone in the world should be in the same building, a big box. Kinder and gentler than the harsh metal frame of modernism like planting it in concrete. Know this, the international school wanted one building, no historic precedent. You could put that anywhere in any country around the globe. And you know when that really was popular in the 1970s? I could put you on a jet plane and blindfold you and drop you in any major city and you might not know where you were at. Everything started looking the same. 
If you ever have a chance, there's a movie that takes place inside an international style skyscraper, a humorous look at modern architecture by the great French Belgium comedian Jacques Tati from 1968. It's called Playtime. Highly recommended. Now I'm going to turn the time machine dial to the 1980s and we come to the mirror building. Yeah. Contextualism, right? Look how they're blending in with the environment. The curve follows the curve of the river as best possible. Come back to the Xbox building. That was the former Midwest Commodities Exchange. Once upon a time before the digital age, financial traders on Wall Street stood on a trading floor, waving at each other with hand signals. To make sure you could see those all important buy and sell trade signs, they have no internal support but are using a trust tube to support the ceiling from the outside. Now the building with a little red Lego block coming up on our left, I've got a confession to make. Most of us tour guides never even talked about this building. It did not excite us that much until five years ago when I believe the owner sat down and said, hey, let's try to get ourselves on the tour guide's map by putting ourselves on the map. So they spent $800,000 and they painted a map of the Chicago River and they put themselves on the map. That red dot is this very building. You are here. Isn't that better than GPS? I wish all major cities have map buildings so the next time myself, a bicyclist, actually has to rent, rent a car in Atlanta, Georgia, I'm going to be able to get off that cloverleaf highway in less than four hours time. Adaptive reuse in a big way on our right, the former Chicago Central Post Office. Movie fans, if you remember the Batman movie, The Dark Knight, welcome to the Gotham City Bank that Heath Ledger's Joker was robbing in the opening scene. 2.7 million square feet, largest post office on earth in 1921, Yeah. We might have needed such a ginormous building because the mail order catalog business was invented in Chicago in 1872 by that friend of the farmer, A. Montgomery Ward, followed by Sears and Roba. But elevators tend to slow down the mail. Waiting for elevators can feel like waiting for the go. Who knows if they're going to show up. So the post office hasn't been there since 1995. Moved due south to a more efficient building. You'll see it shortly. Now, if you're from Chicago, we watched the abandoned post office for 20 years, 25 years. Developers come and go, announce great plans, and you know what? They all turned out to be a lot of sound and fury signifying nothing. So it was pretty exciting about three years ago when 601 West Coast showed up with $600 million for the project. You see, I did my homework. I started to dig and found out 601 West, they had a big hand developing the west side of Manhattan in New York City. I said, all right, this is a company with a crack record. I dig a little deeper. I find out they own the Civic Opera Building, their vested interest in Chicago. And you know what? They did everything right with the old post office. Now, when you have a big project, what do you think one of the first things you want to do in a rebuilding project like that? Get an anchor tenant. An anchor tenant just to get the ball rolling. Boom. They secure Walgreens corporate to move in. And then the clients start moving in. Home chef meal delivery, Ferrara chocolate, Uber ride share. I've got to check this out again, but I know Pepsi Cola was looking at this building. Now, Pepsi has 16 floors of the skyscraper in Chicago. They might want to move their whole operation laterally over here. And then, is everyone familiar? I always like to do polls every now and then. Who has ever heard the term in building LEADS certification? L E E D S. Yeah. Well, that stands for Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design. It essentially means you are willing to try to reduce the waste your building produces, reduce your carbon footprint. So they're going to go for that. And one of the ways they'll do that. <laughs> put a green roof on the top of that building. If you work there, you get to go jogging through prairie grass on your life. Now let's look to our left. Zoom, the skyline of tall buildings drops off a bit because we're getting further from the business district of Chicago. Now, the river walk is really popping right here. You're going to see a great little stone amphitheater coming up as well. Perfect for social distancing acoustic concerts right now. Um, a lot of condo activity but you don't see the big buildings because the Chicago business district, the Louvre, had definite borders. The river was north, the lake, of course, was east. You wanted to be as close to the lake as possible for shipping south and west railroad tracks. Now, back in the day, if you were in business, you wanted to squeeze downtown where the action was. 
think way back before cell phones, before email, dare I say it, before text messaging. Business started out as the art of the handshake. You would meet your customer not to Facebook to Facebook, but face to face. You know, I used to put two human beings in the same room, and they just sit there and talk to each other. OMG, imagine sin. Necessity was the mother of invention in Chicago. You see where I'm going with this? We didn't have any other choice in Chicago. We had so many people and we couldn't sprawl out. So we had to get innovative and come up with higher and higher buildings. Now, River City, 1986, can you guess the architect? It can only be Bertrand Goldberg, right? The same architect who did the corn cob shape, Marina City Towers. Goldberg was a modernist who thought outside the box. Pun is intended to say that. So remember when his teacher, Mies von Rommel's peers, are doing all that black box modernism of the 60s? He rebels. And he gets out his journal and he writes, I rebel. Against a century of static. I rebel against the straight line. I refuse to remake humanity in the image of a machine. Turning to nature once again, Goldberg said River City came to him. His inspiration was a mythical river snake. And it would have looked serpentine had all five buildings as planned gone 400 meters to the next bridge. A free thinker dancing to a different room. Can you see the invisible hand of the greatest outlier architect ever from Barcelona, Antonio Gaudi, as an influence on Bertrand Goldberg? I do know Bertrand Goldberg was very fond. He was fond of that Gaudi quote, there are no right angles in nature. Folks, time for a little hydration break. How's everyone doing? You staying hydrated? Drink water, drink vodka, whatever you need to stay hydrated. Was made up since 1893 when newspaper reporter Michael Hearn was interviewed during the World's Fair and told the whole story. A couple of the newscats found a piece of broken land and blamed poor Mrs. O'Leary because it was a great story on a slow news day. The legend refused to die, so on October 6, 1997, a century after the fire, the Chicago City Council called in historians two days before the anniversary who proved without a shadow of a doubt that Mrs. O'Leary and Daisy the Cow were totally innocent. And you ought to be looking at their neighbor, that shady guy, Hank like Sullivan. He's the guy that reported the fire, possibly because he was stealing beer from the O'Leary's barn and he used the fire to cover up his own crime. Mrs. O'Leary and her cow totally exonerated. Huzzah for cows, Daisy got her day. But I must tell you this, that fire is never far from my mind. I believe that fire gives even the present day Chicagoans our spirit, our mental, and our will. Imagine the day after the fire with a third of the city gone, 17,450 buildings in 30 hours time. But the builders don't wait. By dawn's early light, the next morning after the fire, they stand in the fire district counting only 14 buildings left out of thousands. And then the sign of hope appears. They see a little yellow castle on the horizon. You must find it after the tour yourself. Two blocks from the Green Building and Chicago Michigan Avenue. Your visitor center, the water tower is what they saw. The water tower, a little yellow castle, built in 1869 as a standby for the water pumping station. And when the fire of 71 came roaring downtown, the water tower said, no thanks, I'm sticking around and escaped the fire without a scratch. The builders had a common thought. It was like ESP from brain to brain. We will rebuild this city. And that comes down to us today as Chicago's unofficial model, I will, and the builders did. And that spirit of I will has been driving us forward ever since. It was alive and well in 1974. That's when we achieved the tallest building in the world for 24 years. Still the tallest in Chicago with its antenna in front of you now. The Sears now Willis Tower. 1,451 feet. You actually don't count the antennas. Architect Bruce Graham. And from Bangladesh, first engineering partner for Skidmore Owings and Merrill Pepper, Fosler County. Construction technique, bungle tube. Isn't that a nice metaphor? It's like a bundle of sticks wrapped together for strength. Nine number nine, contiguous steel tubes, each is 75 foot square. Two stop at 50 floors, two at 66, three at 90, the final 110 stories. Reduce the mass of the building because you're in the Windy City. Although Chicago's nickname Windy City had nothing to do with the wind. It referred to our early politicians bragging all the time. They were like me, full of hot air. 
but this is a windy city with 81 mile an hour winds. You have to deal with that. I look at my Sears Tower, I think about the wind. And that brings to my mind the great Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu, writing in the Tao Te Ching, can one learn to be flexible? Can you follow the way of nature, the Tao? Can you yield and overcome? Can you bend and still remain straight? And I say, yeah, my Sears Tower must follow the Tao, the way of nature. It can bend and remain straight. If need be, a sway possibility under heavy winds, 18 inches, the top of the building can move left to tallest building in the world for 24 years. Now the tallest building in the world today is the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. You might know that building. It showed up in one of those Tom Cruise Mission Impossible movies, those great works of uh, cinematic achievement. The Burj Khalifa is 2,717 feet. Designed by Chicago guy, our architect, Adrian Smith. Peter and Ella of France are a mural team. I love that they have come to Chicago. Look at their work right there. It's called the Native American, lost in Chicago, dreaming. And look at the gaze. The gaze goes right to the statue of Ceres, the Roman goddess of grain, perched atop the Art Deco Board of Trade, 1930, the Annex by Helmut Jahn, Contextualism, 1980. At 605 feet, that, because nothing else was happening, right? from 1930 to 1955, remained the tallest building in Chicago for 25 years. Now John Storrs, the sculptor, he did not get the statue of Ceres a face. Who would see him way up there was a common thing. But in Art Deco, statues don't have features. I bet you know this. What's a very famous Art Deco statue? Oscar, the Academy Award. Who made the Oscars for years? Chicago, of course. Let's go right to the pink tower in front of the Sears Tower, 311 South Wacker, Kong Tudor, Fox, 1990. Another world record for Chicago at 961 feet. That, while the Sears Tower that year was still the tallest building in the world, you have the tallest concrete reinforced structure in the world right next door. It has been described as castellated Gothic, looking like the turret of a Gothic castle, but look at the crown. A very modern, 10-story drum of glass filled now with fluorescent, and now I know they're switching to a lot of LED lights, but it's still pretty bright. Now later this evening, when you see that building from a slight distance, illuminated against the, shall we say, dark and wondrous Chicago American night, you may hear Chicago and sometimes calling it the White Castle. A nickname it earned because it makes us hungry for sliders, White Castle hamburgers. It looks like the restaurant late at night. For the uninitiated, White Castle is a famous Midwestern restaurant with Gothic facade. I'm not making a joke here, I verify my information. It was 2009 when a White Castle restaurant executive from Columbus, Ohio took my tour. And I found out the White Castle restaurant logo and 311 South Wacker both were modeled and inspired to look like the Water Tower, your visitor center which escaped the Great Chicago Fire, which awaits you even now at Chicago and Michigan Avenue Hill. Look at the sheer face of the Sears Willis Tower, my friends, and can you imagine for me that you are French? Your name is Alain Robert, but the whole world calls you Spider-Man. Alain Robert is the French Daredevil. August 1999, this is the 21st anniversary of his ascent, free climb, no climbing equipment, of the outside of the Sears Tower. He didn't climb the Golden Gate Bridge of San Francisco, he went home to Paris for the Eiffel Tower. And then finally, the top of the mountain, the Jolly Jolly, with their permission, he danced on the roof of the Burj Khalifa 55. Would you humor me and consider the mind of building climber along the road here for a second, how he must look at the universe? Because in its simplest definition, my friends, what is architecture? We can very simply define architecture as being the way that we interact with and define the space we live in. You or I look at the Sears Tower, perhaps saying linear function. The Daredevil Rivera stakes up behind us and says, aha, all I can see is an obstacle to help me overcome my greatest fear in life. What is the Daredevil building climber most afraid of? Heights. This is why he's climbed every tall building for 40 years. He's still trying to get over it. Maybe it's time for a new therapy. 2009, London-based insurance brokerage, the Willis Group, takes over three floors of the Sears Tower. It is renamed Willis Tower. So we honor the new name, but in the Chicago neighborhoods, we pronounce the word Willis Sears. It's a neighborhood thing. 
gazed way up there. Who was trying to go to the sky deck? There's a little glass box on the 103rd floor protruding from the building, and it has a glass floor. Now, here's the deal. You have to make a reservation that's only open weekends. If you go to the sky deck, I believe it is very similar to the Schrodinger's cat experiment in quantum physics. There's only two possibilities. Number one, you look 103 floors straight down, and you say, this is cool, I'm walking on air. Number two, you look 103 floors straight down, and you go, not cool, where's the bathroom, I'm gonna be sick. That's up to you and how you deal with height. Oh, I just read a review by a young mother. She took her toddlers, three years old and five years old, up to the sky deck. As soon as they get out of the elevator, zoom! The kids slide on their belly, face down, looking 103 floors down, saying, Mom, isn't this cool? Where is Mom? Plastered against the back wall, going, I'm good. Have fun. The mother, in her article, she said she was terrified. Her children had no fear whatsoever. You know what? I don't think the kids understood the, wait for it, gravity of the situation. And I promise I will never make, make it on that bad again. This is my favorite engineering story on the river on the right, the former Chicago Mercantile Pain Center. Two 40-store office towers house a 40,000 square foot, again, column-free for the financial traders trading floor. The ceiling structure was supported by the load-bearing walls on either end. However, note that they did to increase office space. The top 34 stories are cantilevered out, and they serrated the corners so they could double the number of corner offices and more people could feel important. Oh, yeah. But the extra space meant now the two towers are in danger of tilting in under their own weight. Thus, structural engineering firm Alfred Benesi Company, to alleviate the problem, made a mathematical calculation. They would not build the tower straight. Instead, they pulled the floor plates out, one-eighth of an inch progressively, from ground to 21st floor, then reversed it. Are you with me here? We have just given the towers a camber, an artificial bow. Now that the weight begins to shift, they push it down, causing the building to straighten, once again, into a plumb line. That's mathematics. That's engineering. I'd like to give my passengers secret history you won't hear on the other tours. Well, with 3,000 miles of railroad tracks, my friends, are you aware that Chicago is the hobo capital of the world when everybody used to hop freight trains to build this country? Madison Street, the past London, was once known around the world as hobo India hipster neighborhood of hobos, tramps, artists, and the wobblies, the industrial workers of the world fighting for that one big union, founded here in 1905. And you know what? You can hop a freight in Chicago, receive a hobo college diploma from the hobo college at Halstead and Madison, go on over to the Dill Temple Club, and you're hanging out with Chicago poet uh -huh. Carl Sandler, the writer Gene Barnes, the boxer Jack Johnson, the lawyer Clarence Darrow, and the hobo lecture tradition has never died in Chicago. It's still going on. For the last 50 years, under the auspices of a lecture series run by the College of Complexes, the playground for people who think. Go to one of their Saturday night lectures in Chicago, and after the main speaker the rebuttal period, anybody in the house can have the speaker's platform for five minutes, and you can say whatever is on your mind. And you know all they ask? is if you still, still follow the old Google College motto. They say, please, make your speech. But they said, but please, everybody, never interrupt another speaker, as they prefer to only be one fool talking at a time. If you want to learn more about that hobo history, I'll give you their website after. Now I have another question for you about the inverted pyramid building 150 North Riverside. What does this building do you think have in common with a guitar string? What happens if we pluck a string on a guitar? It oscillates, so the buildings, they have more sway than you might think. In fact, this building has so much sway when they did the wind test, they had to have a very heavy counterweight, and the counterweight is water. There are 12 water tanks at the top of this building, holding 160,000 gallons of water. Are you ready for the fancy engineering term? You would call those inertial slosh mass dampeners. That's a lot fancier than it sounds, isn't it, when you get down to what really happens. What that means is every time the building starts to sway one way, the inertia is the weight of that water, it doesn't feel like moving. So 
so your building is like my puppy dog on the leash. It can only go so far, it comes back. And then the water's going in the opposite direction, cramping the effect of the sway of the good shock of the a lot of mojo on the corner on the right where the Great Lakes building stands. In 1833, this was the site of the Ash Hotel. Chicago's only hotel was a barracks with a pig wallow for a street, run by the French-Canadian Creole fiddle player, Mark Bobian. Going for saying, I fiddle like a devil, keep a hotel like hell, yeah. But it was the Saganash where 13 electors sat down, voted 12 against one to incorporate. Thus, on March 4th, 1837, Chicago becomes Chicago, the city. You'd think that was enough history for one bank of the Chicago River, right? No. In 1860, they put up a rickety wood building here called the Wigwam in five weeks to host the Republican National Convention. 10,000 delegates and visitors turned inside a building meant for only 5,000. And after a little backroom dealing, handshaking, you vote for my candidate and I will vote for y'all, son. This is where one Mr. Abraham Lincoln received nomination to run for the what is on such a historic site today? The building where Ferris Bueller's dad worked in the popular Chicago teen movie comedy, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. 333 was hard to drive. Again, such a great example of contextualism. We were talking about contextualism. So here's one more reference in this building. So the curve is obviously for the river, the glass what's architectural skyline. Now look even at the support columns. They are not round, they are octagonal in shape. That is a reference to history, backwards in time. To understand it, we have to go backwards in time. Not a problem like Dr. Who. I'm a time lord, all on Z. Look to your left. Look at the corners of the mart. Lo and behold, you have the same geometry. Isn't that a simple gesture? Buildings can talk to each other. Buildings can have a conversation if you give them a common language. And the language of buildings are their elements of design. So it was so simple to decide to have octagonal columns that they opened the history when they do that. Now when Joe Kennedy took over the merchandise mart in 1945, he suddenly realized he had 96 acres of floor space. And that would suit the furniture design industry who have showrooms throughout today and the retail stores for us on the lower floors. Oh, the heads along the bank were added by Joe Kennedy. Now those statues are not, as the comedian David Letterman facetiously once claimed, they are not the Pez Candy Company Hall of Fame. They are not giant Pez heads. You do not press their head and a giant piece of candy flies out, no. They are merchant princes added by Joe Kennedy, such as Marshall Field, F.W. Ward, A. Montgomery Ward. If you'd like to know the eight merchants, I'm always on the dock for you after the tour to answer questions. What do you think of the bed and breakfasts we put in for fish, those areas of green? You know what that means? We've made the river more conducive. I just got an email this week. 60 species of fish have returned to the river. And that's a good thing. We're trying to make the river fish friendly because they filter pollutants out of the water. It's an ecological way to turn the river around. We approach our financial district, LaSalle Street. On our right, the LaSalle Wacker Building, Art Deco, Holden Route 1930. Art Deco often looks like an armchair, a high back, armrest, and a light well. Due to a 1923 setback ordinance that said only one fourth of your building, as you can see right here, was allowed to go above 260 feet. Everything else had to be cut lower. This was because of the physical phenomenon called the canyon effect. The first skyscrapers tended to block all the fresh air and sunlight, turning the streets into a germ incubator. So that ordinance was put in place so that fresh air and sunlight would make it down to the street level. I probably saw too many Disney movies as a kid. I tend to give my skyscrapers human characteristics. Every time I look at this neoclassical building, 45 degrees on the right, I say, aha, if the Parthenon from ancient Greece came to Chicago on vacation and married a skyscraper, this is the result. 77 was Wacker Drive from Spanish architect Ricardo Bofil. Bofil, a modern classicist. Now let's look at this. A Greek temple style roof, portico's pilasters to give you the idea of Greek columns, and yet those classic elements are married to the glass curtain wall of modernism. I love seeing this building. It's two. It's two. It's two buildings in one. By day, modernism. The glass face catches your eye. Come back after dark. Those mirrors will almost disappear into the darkness. And you can see there are theatrical lighting fixtures on the pilasters to illuminate them even a little more. Late at night, I look at this building and I 
I believe I hear the voice of the Oracle at Delphi whispering in my ear. 35 West Wacker Drive with the checkerboard finish, home to our largest advertising firm, the Wheel Burnett Company. Irish architect Kevin Gross, perhaps nodding to Louis Sullivan's Chicago School ideal of a building as Greek column based shaft capital. This building got quite a bit of publicity in November 2014 when Nick Melinda of the circus family, the Flying Melindas, showed up in Chicago, stringing a tightrope wire from Marina City West across the river to the Leo Burnett building. You know I was on the river that day giving tours. It was November, it was freezing. So my captain and crew and I retired to the Billy Goat Tavern below the Wrigley building to watch it on TV, we were one block away. But Melinda was wearing a wire, a microphone, so we could hear every word he said. As he made the seven minute walk across the Chicago River at a height of 671 feet, he never stopped praying. And the prayer basically kind of went, please don't let me fall in my water. And guess what, he made it, he made it across the river. Look at that beautiful dark green art deco building with the 50 foot gold cap. Looks like a giant bottle of champagne, you know? Giant bottle of champagne. Today it is the Hotel St. Jane, named for our first social worker, Jane Adams. But the fact that it looks like a bottle of champagne might have been intentional. It was literally designed during prohibition. Back then, you couldn't go legally pop and cork on a bottle of bubbly. Designed by the Burnham Brothers, Dan Jr. and Hugh, for Union Carbide, the design may have been editorial comment on the era. That is 24 karat gold up there, but it's painted on pretty thin. You know how thin? Well, you know sandwich wrap, saran wrap? It's half the thickness of saran wrap. Now friends, this is the potential of the river walk right here, this part where this park is our Illinois-Vietnam War, Veterans Memorial, and Wall, a favorite of Chicagoans. And now like a rocket ship about to take off, the skinniest guys were from Chicago on our right, 75 East Wacker Drive, it's only nine and a half foot across that octagonal front. And you can see they just squeezed in London House, there are little tiny little people up there. You go through the London Guarantee and actually don't even get there. 75 East Wacker, by the way, had the distinction of being the tallest building in Chicago in 1928. For seven days, one week, fame, thou art so fleeting. Now coming up on our left, friends, just east of the Wrigley Building, French Gothic Revival style Tribune Tower. Look at those upside down L's flying buttresses there. Tribune Tower, former home of the Chicago Tribune newspaper, 1922. Colonel Robert McCormick published in the Tribune, which he claims is the world's greatest newspaper, to that the world's most beautiful office building to match. He offers $100,000 prize money, 264 entries come in from around the world. Everything is suggested from ancient Egyptian to Bauhaus, the new modernist style. But the winners, Howells and Hood, inspired by the great Gothic cathedrals of France and Belgium, French stone based since he goes flying buffers since 1945. And I happen to mention the Tribune newspaper moved out and that building is gone condominium. You can live there for $700,000 to $7 million. I invite my passengers to join me, pool our resources, we shall acquire the penthouse, change our last name to the Adams family, and we're going to live up there in Gothic splendor. So if you want to get in on the ground floor of that, let me know. And what could be more different after the ordainness of the Caribbean Tower than the utter simplicity of the brand new Apple computer store by my favorite London architect, Sir Norman Foster, doing more with less, with a pressed glass wall and a roof that looks like an Apple Rock Tower. Now friends, if you walk the Magnificent Mile, you want to start right here at the Wrigley Building. Go downstairs to the Billy Goat Tavern, which inspired the Bill Murray Cheeseburger Cheeseburger sketch for Saturday Night Live. Two blocks down, you find the water tower that escaped the fire. Look at the water tower, think about its history. Think about something you want to get done in your own life and use Chicago's motto and say, I will. Now the end point of your tour is coming up 90 degrees to our left, the only place we'll be able to see it from here. It's Big John, the former John Hancock Center, the first of our giants, 1969, 1127 feet, 100 stories. That was Bruce Graham and Dr. Fazekan before the Willis Tower. Now, I'll grant the Willis Tower is taller, 
but that's the work of art. You want to see that building from its base. Just stand gazing upon it for 20 seconds. You will feel like you are flying although your feet are on the ground. This is the power of art and architecture to move us. And if you're adventurous, take the elevator over the 94th floor. They have reopened Chicago 360, a glass box with eight windows. You get in with seven other people, you hold on for dear life. They start that motor and tilt you 30 degrees in the thin air. No one knows why. Okay, let's take another look at Jeannie Gang's Aqua Tower on our right. Jeannie Gang is very ecologically oriented. She worries about birds crashing into buildings. So she was very happy after she designed this building to find out that birds can read those asymmetrical balconies. So they're flying, they look at that building, and they go, yeah, don't go over there. There's something wrong over there. And so they won't go crashing into it. If you ever find a bird in Chicago, that has crashed into a skyscraper, do not despair. Get out your phone and call the Chicago Bird Monitor Organization. They'll come and try and nurse it back to help. Ah, Harry Weiss, who gave us those charming little river cottages in the modernist Spain, gives us a Swiss hotel, triangular design, which predates all the buildings in front of it. So back when Harry was designing the Swiss hotel, we had a view to the lake, indeed. You could say the function was to give two full sides of this building a lakefront view so the crime was all that. But as Mies van der once said, God is in the details. I believe as an architect, you must be omniscient. You have to see everything. So Harry had to be concerned with the people on the back wall of the hotel. So notice, instead of being flushed with the office building behind them, notice how he turned the crime on its axis. So if you're on the back, you get a great view of the Wrigley Building clock tower in downtown. That lone kayaker on our left has been here since 1673. They were with Father Marquette and Louis Joliet. They got separated from the main party. They've been going up and down the Chicago River for 400 years. Au revoir, my friends. Comment ça va? Ça va bien. I hope you find Marquette and Joliet. Coming up on our left is a beautiful Grand Granite Fountain, Centennial Fountain, designed by Ludwig Mies van der Spen, Dirk Lohan, in 1989 to commemorate the group that reversed the current of the Chicago River, now known as the Chicago Metropolitan Water Reclamation District. Lohan's artistic intent was to show the interconnectedness of water, how water begins with the source. That would be the base of the fountain. Water finds a way to spread. That's the pyramid, which when I turned on, shoots an 80-foot arc across the Chicago River. And then water returns to yet a different source, and that different source would actually be the Chicago River over here. So it's artistic because people love to look at the beautiful fountain. It's functional. When you aerate water, that oxygen is going to be made use of by the fish in the river. Now just east of Lake Shore Drive, the only skyscraper east of Lake Shore Drive. The Lake Point Tower Condominium is 1968, Shipwright and Heinrich. Inspired possibly by the teacher Mies van der idea for an all glass tower in the 1920s, Berlin. Tallest town in the world in 1968, 645 feet, first turbulent air skyscraper. Although I've called that building with three wings and a button on top, Lake Point Tower for 20 years, I have now been informed by 9, 10, and 11 year old kids on my tour to drop that name and call it the Fidget Spinner instead. Hence, I give you the Fidget Spinner. When kids repeatedly got off the boat telling me that was a fidget spinner, I was elated because it meant children were having an emotional experience with a building on an architectural cruise, which is what we're after, is it not? Viewing arts and architecture is your chance for self, meaning you, to meet other. But there is no meaning until the circle of self and the circle of other inter intersects. We must find the gestalt. We must find the common ground. So when kids look at that building and say it's a fidget spinner, I can connect and say, yeah, and why would you want to make your building look like a fidget spinner? Because your goal is to give the people living inside the greatest lakefront views possible without taking away their privacy while dealing with an entire wall made of glass. And what better way to do that than to separate those three things apart? Stretching out into the lake is Dave Pier, part of Vernon's plan. Arcade Great Pier, 1916, World War II Naval Training Base. Today, one of the most visited destinations in Chicago, complete with Ferris wheel. 
And finally, we are separated from the lake by a physical barrier, the Chicago Locks, holding in fresh water since 1938, when every Great Lakes state and Canada soon Chicago the reverse of the river, and possible line the Great Lake, which is a human being, you should know, the five Great Lakes are 20% right here. 20% of the fresh water in liquid form on the entire planet Earth. So the court ends up giving us the number of barrels per day and using the I will spirit of Chicago, we put in the locks so we can keep the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes. It's an elevator for boats. If you go out to the lake, they open the lake gate, you rise up to the fire, you come back, they drain you. And that, my friends, is one more example of the I will spirit of Chicago. For that spirit of I will took us from bouncing back from the fire to host the World's Fair, to become the Chicago School of Architecture, to attract Mies van der the modernist, through the Illinois Institute of Technology and Mies to spread modernism around the world, and to keep attracting great architects like Jeannie Gang and Ketch Partners. When it comes to architecture in Chicago, I am convinced the future will be right. Okay, folks, just a little bit of housekeeping right now. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you all for choosing Shoreline Sightseeing. My name is Kevin, I have been your guide. I'm going to be waiting for you all at the top of the ramp as you disembark to take your questions and say goodbye. Mana shuna qilib cruizam tugadi. Nima deydi? Sizlarga hammaga yaxshi niyat, yaxshi kayfiyat tilagan holda qalbingizda hech qachon mehr, oqibat, saxovat tark etmasin. Tushuntingizni ham dollarlar pachka-pachka tark etmasin. Agar dollar tark etib ketsa, hech ham mushkulli kayfiyatga tushmang. Oyni 15 qorong'i bo'lsa, 15 yorug'. Hammasi yaxshi bo'ladi. Yaxshi kayfiyat hamrohingiz bo'lsin. Yana sizlar bilan Bizi kanalda görüşkünce. Hayır, salamat olun.